from the world's leading center for finance, the arts, publishing, science, research, media, innovation, and much more. This is Metro Focus with Rafael P. Roman. Tonight, why mentors may be the answer to a tough problem in schools. You need additional adults who are going to constantly be in the ear of that student. The Rockefeller Foundation's president has some ideas for New York's mayor. He absolutely must appoint a chief resilience officer. Bringing a workhorse of war back to life. For three years, that Huey was my whole life. That was my job. And what Downton Abbey and a big Broadway hit have in common. Funding for this program is made possible by the Ford Foundation, working with visionaries on the front lines of social change worldwide. Corporate funding for Metro Focus is provided by Mutual of America, your retirement company, and by the following. Hello, I'm Rafael P. Roman. Welcome to Metro Focus. What inspired you to go to school and stay in school? What makes students want to go to college? One answer is mentors, but only one in 10 New York City students has a mentor, and sometimes those relationships last only a year. We're going to hear from the CEO of a growing new program called iMentor that combines face-to-face -face mentoring with email and four-year-long relationships. But first, reporter Rick Carr takes us to the Academy of Software Engineering, a New York public high school with iMentoring built into the curriculum. When the Academy for Software Engineering welcomed its first freshman class to a building near the heart of the city's technology industry two years ago, its teachers and administrators knew that preparing the students for careers in technology meant preparing them to go to college first. And they knew that was more likely to happen if they had some help. You need additional adults who are going to constantly be in the ear of that student, constantly, constantly be looking out for opportunities, uh, resources that might help them take that path towards college. In other words, Principal Seung Yu says college educated professionals who could serve as role models. It's still be a little overwhelming for some of our students, but that's where you can come in and help them. So not long after that first freshman class arrived in the fall of 2012, every single student was paired with a mentor. A nonprofit called iMentor finds those adults, trains them, and coordinates what they do with students. It also runs classes that are integral to the school's curriculum. I want to bring everyone back and ready to share their opinions. The classes are designed to help students develop what are known as the soft skills that will help them succeed in college and their careers. Not how to write good computer code, but instead things like how to set goals and think critically about controversial topics. Every single one of you has an experience with metal detectors. Once a week, students email their mentors to discuss those ideas. Once a month, the mentors come to the school cafeteria to spend an evening with their students for dinner and some FaceTime. For some students, a mentor may be the only adult they know who can speak from experience about applying to college, getting a degree, and building a professional career. Sophomore Noel Pope says his parents didn't have those experiences. My mom is unemployed, and my dad, he's a cable technician. But Pope's mentor was chief technology officer of a large Wall Street firm. He also shares Pope's passion for math. I want to be a mathematician, so there's probably colleges that I've never heard of that have like really good math courses and that would be really beneficial for me. So he can like help me with that. Even students whose parents can speak from experience about college and career say they get a lot out of their relationships with their mentors. Freshman Linda Mkapa practically swoons whenever her mentor, Julie Tekral, says the name of the social networking company she works for. Teen girls are all over Tumblr, Linda included. Love Tumblr. <laughs> They've only known each other since fall, but Mkapa says they're already good friends. And she's already learned a big lesson from Tekral. She's taught me that you don't necessarily have to choose what you want to be now. You can definitely change in the future. Like when I came, I thought I would just like be set to be a lawyer and she said that she wanted to be a lawyer when she was my age but she found other interests that she's happier with and maybe I can do the same. At the Academy for Software Engineering the adults pledge to stay with their students for four years and they know they'll have to put more effort into the relationship as students get closer to graduation and start asking for advice on where to go to college, what to study, how to apply. Tim Allen says he's fine with that. He volunteered to be a mentor because he wants to see more African-Americans with careers in the tech industry. This kid, he's just, he's kind of smart. 
you know. He's, he's a cool kid to hang out with. Bryce Johnson isn't all that interested in the details of Alan's current job at an ad agency where he works on apps and other technology. But he is very interested in Alan's last job, which was at a firm that makes special effects software. I'm a movie guy. Like, I watch movies. I wonder how in the world they do that. And he, he used to do, he used to work with technology. So now I, I don't have to only learn about technology in school. I can also learn it from like somebody that I already did. Principal Seung Yu says the mentoring program is not easy to run. He says school officials have to dedicate a lot of effort to helping mentors from the moment they volunteer. Explaining to mentors what the commitment is, getting them the appropriate training, and then helping the schools relay the same message to the students and to the parents. The academy has resources that other schools don't, like backing from one of New York's most prominent venture capitalists and support from big tech firms. The technology industry has been at the center of the city's economic development strategy for a few years now. All of that may be why the iMentor program has so far managed to avoid the thing that makes it so hard to expand other mentoring programs across the country. The shortage of college-educated professionals willing to volunteer and put in the effort. For Metro Focus, I'm Rick Carr near Union Square in Manhattan. And joining me now is Mike O'Brien, the CEO of iMentor. Thanks for having me. Very impressive stuff. But iMentor is not just in the academy. That's right. A software engineering year and many other schools. So give us a big picture. Who are you and what are you trying to accomplish? I mentor partners with public high schools. We go into those schools and match every single student in the school with a mentor, college-educated mentor that's going to interact with that student every week of their high school career. Big picture, we're trying to partner with the schools that have the biggest college challenge, serving majority first-generation college students from low-income communities, and prove that those students can get into college and complete college at the same rates as their peers all across the country. And preparing students for college, that's the primary goal? College completion is the primary goal. College readiness is the first step. According to a John Hopkins study that was recently issued, they found that mentoring does indeed work. So why are so few schools mentoring in the city? It's really difficult for individual schools to build the capacity to run a high quality mentoring program. That's why partnerships between schools and programs like ours is really getting things in the right place. And so when we partner with the high school, they don't need to recruit the mentors. They don't need to provide the case management for these relationships. What they need to do is help us deeply integrate what's going on in these relationships with what the students need and what's already going on in that school. Now, now the school has to pay I mentor for That's your right. services. All right, why, why do they have to pay and, and is it expensive? I mean, the, their schools are obviously in need of funds. Yeah. So I mentor fundraises privately for 80% of the cost mm -hmm. of the program. It generally costs schools about what it costs them to have a single counselor in the school. And so our value proposition to schools is for the price of a single counselor, I mentor is going to put 400 college graduates and four full-time staff members in that school to ensure that every student has the individualized support they need to get ready for college and succeed once they're there. And schools end up feeling like that's an important value proposition. Vast majority of our schools pay for iMentor services out of their general operating budget, out of their counseling and college readiness budgets. Uh, where did iMentor get started and who started? Uh, iMentor was started uh, by John Griffin uh, and two public interest lawyers in 1999. Started with 49 students in a single school, Christ the King in South Bronx. 13 school years later, we're serving 3,000 students in 18 high schools across the country, going to 6,000 students by 2018. It'll be the largest mentoring presence in any single city in the U.S., just here in New York City. And the name iMentor, where did that come from? It was 1999. It was yeah. i-everything. Uh, <laughs> but the original innovation was, could this hybrid of weekly curriculum-structured email communication and monthly in-person meetings provide the flexibility you needed to get many more people to do it? It was, it was also a time where uh, email was just starting to become ubiquitous, and it was pretty obvious the way that this was going to change the way John worked and uh, change lots of neighborhoods he knew about. It wasn't as clear cut how this was going to change life in the Bronx. John could look and see the Bronx from his office window, and the idea was these communities that are so physically proximate to one another don't actually benefit from connecting into New York City's true diversity. And the idea was, could you use email in combination with monthly in-person meetings to get many more people to sign up as mentors? John Griffin could have spent his money in, in a lot of different ways. What was it specifically about this that motivated him to do this particular 
uh, I think work. Uh, this was true for John, and this is true for so many folks who come to our program. Individuals can recognize the impact that mentors have had in their lives. And they see this as a very smart investment on how to give back. But specifically what got folks, what got John and what gets me excited about our work is what we could do with mentoring. Mm -hmm. Our mentor makes four-year relationships instead of a one-year relationship. Mm -hmm. We enroll every student in a school instead of having students come in community programs. We provide a curriculum that structures every week of that four-year relationship. And so the opportunity to not only get many more people to participate as mentors, but to actually provide the scaffolding and support that mentors who aren't education experts, not youth development experts, maybe don't have experience in these communities, how do you wrap around the support that our mentors need to be reliably, predictably effective against a discrete set of outcomes? Uh -huh. That's been our challenge over the last decade. All right, Mike. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for having us. In the more than 14 months since the hurricane named Sandy caught much of the region by surprise, we've heard about rebuilding, rethinking disaster plans, and requests for hundreds of millions of dollars in government funding. But what about the concept of resilience? It's defined as the ability to become strong, healthy, or successful once again after something bad happens. The Rockefeller Foundation is making resilience one of its top priorities. It's funding the 100 Resilient Cities Project and New York is one of the first to receive funding that includes money to hire a chief resiliency officer. And joining me now to talk about that project and more is the president of the Rockefeller Foundation, Dr. Judith Roden. Dr. Roden, thank you so much for joining well, us. Thank you for having me. Now, Dr. Roden, the, the Rockefeller Foundation is urging Mayor de Blasio to use his first 100 days to focus on the issue of resiliency in the city. First of all, how do you define resiliency? as it applies to the city and the region? Well, resilience is really the ability to fail safely and rebound more quickly, and rebound in a way that often makes you more successful, not just against the next shock and stress, but also in the good times, too. So it's really a wonderful concept that has to do with both elasticity and nimbleness, but also setting you on a higher course for the times when stresses aren't occurring. And why is it so important that the mayor should make it a top priority? Well, because his priorities really are about keeping us safe and making sure that the economy is robust, that we continue to try to grow jobs and reduce the divides between us. And shocks and stresses hit the most vulnerable people more intensively. And so one part of the formula for improving the lives of the most vulnerable among us is to build these resilient capacities for us in the city. But it's also a tremendous job creator if you're talking about resilient infrastructure, if you're talking about diversifying our economy so that if one thing goes down, it doesn't take a third of our economy down. You know, Wall Street was closed for two days. Um, it had a tremendous uh, economic impact. So we really think that it would be a win-win for the mayor to make this a high priority early focus. Well, as I mentioned in the introduction, you're not only, the Rockefeller Foundation is not only advocating, it's uh, making a financial contribution for resiliency. And, and talk about that project that's doing that and how it's directly benefiting New York City. Uh, we've committed $100 million, so a very significant sum based on the experience that we've had building resilience around the world. So we were extremely active in New Orleans after Katrina. We've developed a lot of experience in work called the Asian Cities Climate Change Resilience Network, where we've been re uh, building resilience in very hard hit cities in Asia. So for our centennial, which was last year, 2013, we decided that we would support 100 cities around the world to build resilience. We ran a global competition. New York is one of the first 33 winners. And so we will be investing part of that money in New York. But even before Sandy and even before this competition, we were investing in building resilience in New York. What are some of the other resilience priorities that you're proposing? Um, in the post-Sandy recovery, we're funding and collaborating with HUD and the federal Sandy Recovery Task Force in a project in New York called Rebuild by Design, um, which is to use really extraordinarily innovative designers and architects and engineers 
who are imagining and now will get the money through CBDG disaster recovery grants um, to actually build these projects in New York. So one of the winners so far um, is a project called The Big U, um, and that takes all of the land um, that runs from West 56th Street, imagine a U around Lower Manhattan, to East 40th Street, and actually makes the shoreline more resilient, that's where so much flooding occurs, but builds it in a way that adds parkland and recreational facility, um, economic opportunity for small commercial establishments. So all of these really create very innovative structural transformations that are necessary um, with really innovative design and housing and commercial opportunities. And these are examples of the designs that were submitted? Yes, this so this is actually one of the ones that will get implemented um, quite likely. There are many others that are quite interesting um, in the Rockaways, in the Gowanus Canal, in the Meadowlands, where again, there's a wonderful combination of greening and infrastructure. And mm -hmm. often you can put up these protective devices, and we've seen this in the Netherlands, um, and do it in a way that you're not looking at something that looks like steel traps, but are these phenomenal designs that amplify recreational and commercial space. So what concretely do you hope that Mayor de Blasio does with your recommendations? Well, he absolutely must appoint a chief resilience officer. Our resources um, will support that individual, and this is somebody who really will ha must have the capacity within City Hall to kind of bring all the silos together, knock the relevant heads that need to get knocked so that no project gets built without a resilience analysis mm -hmm. around it. Um, no work gets done without thinking about whether it can have multiple functions in allowing us to fail safe safely. All our information systems are going to need to be rethought. Um, we saw in 9-11 and we saw after Sandy that we still don't have the kind of information system technology that is allowing us to rebound effectively. All right, Dr. Roden, thank you so much. Absolutely, thank you. This winter, a group of veterans is finding a new mission, restoring an old workhorse from the Vietnam War. A Huey helicopter is being put back into tip-top shape for a unique museum exhibit to make sure no one forgets the contributions helicopter crews and soldiers made in Vietnam. And the project is making new memories for the veterans, as Lauren Wonko reports now from Wall Township, New Jersey. Veterans roll up their sleeves each Monday to bring this veteran back to life. Huey, a 1964 military helicopter that served two tours in the Vietnam War. It means everything to the uh, Vietnam veterans who rode in those, uh, fought uh, from those, uh, and so forth. And that's, that's the predominantly uh, most everybody that, that went over there. For three years, that Huey was, was my whole life. I mean, that, that was my job. The Huey was the iconic image of the Vietnam War. Known as the Helicopter War, over 7,000 Hueys flew in Vietnam. The helicopters transported soldiers to combat assaults, brought much-needed supplies, carried wounded soldiers from the field. The Huey was a lifesaver to these veterans, and now they're devoting their time to restore it. The veterans have been working on the project for nearly a year, and so far they've logged more than 3,000 hours. This isn't a job to these vets, it's a mission and an opportunity to bond. The thing that's that's important to me is being with my fellow veterans. You know, no matter where, where you're a veteran from, you're you're a brother. So it's a form of therapy. It's a brotherhood. And um, I, when I have to miss uh, a couple of times, I did. I, I just I felt horrible. And when I got back, it was like it, literally like being back home. The New Jersey Vietnam Veterans Memorial Foundation received the Huey from the New Jersey National Guard. The veterans, both young and old, unite around the helicopter. Everyone asks what's it like to work with the old guys, and you know, it's not really the old guys. If you sit around and close your eyes and talk to them, it's the same stories, the same scenarios, just different times. They sand, paint, seal the doors, reinsert some of the gauges in the instrument panel, paint and reupholster the pilot seats, all so future generations can understand and appreciate the Huey's history at the Vietnam Era Museum in Holmdel. We believe in our military again and we're proud of our military again. And, and even though 
40 years ago, uh, we, we confused the warrior with the war. That's changed in, in recent times, and partly because Vietnam veterans said it'll never happen to another generation. With this project and projects like this, it will help Americans realize what we've sacrificed and what the American people need to remember so we don't repeat our past. The Huey will be unveiled at the Vietnam Era Museum in May on Remembrance Day. The helicopter will be dedicated to all the air crews who served in Vietnam. In Wall Township, I'm Lauren Wonko for Metro Focus. What do Downton Abbey and a Broadway show set in Harlem have in common? A lot more than you might think. On the top-rated British drama where manners rule, it's 1922 and jazz is all the rage for the characters upstairs and downstairs. On this side of the pond, the musical After Midnight is bringing the music, history, and rhythm of the jazz age to present-day New York. One of the principal dancers and the director-choreographer of After Midnight have the story of jazz and the Harlem Renaissance. After Midnight, Early blue evening, lights ain't come on yet. Coming on now. After Midnight is a musical that is based on um, Harlem, Harlem Renaissance, 1930s. Um, and it's essentially, I think it's the journey of many characters coming to the Cotton Club. This was a place where a lot of African Americans used to dance and sing and act. Out of the slavery, out of the migration, out of all of that became this surge of creativity in the African American world. Jazz, this Duke Ellington especially, um, I loved it, I loved it. I'd always been aware of it, I'd always listened to it. It's always been in my um, subconscious somewhere. Uh, but researching the show, I, I absolutely fell in love with, with this music all over again. It is unbelievable. It's unbelievably powerful and evocative, and it, it sounds to me like dialogue. It sounds like beautiful women. It sounds like uh, men having a conversation. It's, it's very easy to, uh, to create to this music. It's interesting, in approaching the show, there, were, you know, there are some things in After Midnight that are absolutely period correct. There is some movement, and some of those vocals are period correct for the 1930s. Absolutely, there is not a step that is not from the 30s in some of those numbers. In other places, I wanted to make, I wanted to make a show for, for my generation, and younger, and younger than me. I didn't want to do a dusty, a dusty old um, museum piece. I really didn't, and I don't think this music is dusty or old. I think this music is, is so vibrant and so alive. My wish for the show that it would be inspired by period, not bound by period. What is the improvisation in, in a place where you do a show eight shows a week? There's got to be a structure. That we all are following a quite a, a very sturdy structure, but it's based on jazz. And it's based on the idea that at one point there will be an improvisation. So we are all eventually waiting for it. The strategy is there to support the improvisation. And whoever's going to catch this, right, because it's cut in many different ways. It can be cut by the trombones, or maybe it's cut by someone's voice. Maybe it's just cut by someone's tap shoe. Like, instead of going pa-pa, they're going to go pa-pa-pa-pa. You know, and you're like, whoa. You're like, immediately everybody perks up because it's unusual. So it keeps us on our toes a lot. Midnight, Harlem. Once it was true, in 1932, Harlem's heartbeat was a drumbeat. One of the other things that was very important to me in After Midnight was actually having spoken word. I wanted to bring in Langston Hughes, which just seemed like the perfect, seemed the perfect choice for the show. I think um, in an evening where there's a lot of music, I think it was very important to go to zero and actually go to spoken word. Um, in some way, it resets the audience. It makes them listen again. They, they start to reattack. The ear reattacks when you have to listen to spoken word. And Langston's poetry is very evocative. It's very evocative. It's all about images. It creates tone. I believe why the audience is so, why are we so riveted? Because in the line of jazz, there is a golden thread that is called freedom. And I do believe jazz was built on, on the oppression, at the time of the oppression of, of the African Americans. So there was a time where the spirit itself was not free. And out of that came this amazing surge, this amazing dedication for freedom. 
Then became the scatting and the this and the that, the rhythm, and next thing you know, jazz was there. That is what the audience is being moved by. I really am, the, I am totally convinced by it. The same way we are moved by it. So it's like there's no, you don't contain it, you can't. You can only be ready for it, right? You can only be available for it. And the audience, for some weird reason, they know it the moment they sit down. There's, even before Dulé speaks, there's something in the air originally that is already like, we feel them, they feel us, we feel the orchestra, we're like, oh, let's go. Do you know what I mean? So I wanted to say that the, the notion of freedom and the concept of freedom is what I feel is running the show. After Midnight is running on Broadway until June 8th, and Downton Abbey is on every Sunday night at 9. Stay tuned for the twists and turns, and yes, there will be a season 5. That's it for this edition of Metro Focus. Join us again next week for news, conversations, and in-depth reporting from New York and New Jersey Public Television. I'm Rafael Piramon. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Funding for this program was made possible by the Ford Foundation, working with visionaries on the front lines of social change worldwide. Corporate funding for Metro Focus is provided by Mutual of America, your retirement company, and by the following.